And then we got the announcement President Johnson was coming with President Marcos and their respective wives. All right, get your shirt out, put the tie on. And indeed, the two presidents came. As I say, I think it was October 66. And they came for this specific purpose of seeing this miracle rice, which is the Philippine jargon for IRA. Well, this was just before lunch, somewhere around 11 o'clock in the morning, they show up. Someone had the foresight to build a wide levee, a walking area, into the field. And that field was right in front of that circle, which was between then administration and our laboratory building. And there was a field of IRA, a plot of IRA out there. And we had this wide levee. It looked to me like the uh, aircraft carrier. I mean, this was so the great man wouldn't fall into the mud. And it was maybe three meters wide and, oh, perhaps five, six meters long. So we troop out there. And it was first Chandler, President Marcos, Beachel, myself, and right behind me, Johnson. And we're starting to walk out on this levee. And I hear this deep southern drawl. I said, boy, I look around. He, I know he's talking to me. I look around. I said, sir. And he repeats. He says, boy, he says, move over to one side. Photographers want to take my picture. Well, I was convinced in my own mind when he said, boy, the first time he's going to ask me how he's going to get out of this mess in Vietnam, or at least some question about IR8. Hell no. He wanted his photograph taken. <laughs> So the boy moved over to one side. <laughs> but that's not the end of that Johnson story. It gets worse. As I say, this was shortly before lunch, and Chandler had laid on a very fine luncheon with the diplomatic corps, Johnson and his wife, President Marcos and his wife, and senior staff. And Rebecca Pasquale outdid herself. It was immaculate. You know, tables were set up with flowers and vases and white tablecloths. It was, it was grand. So we march in there, all the diplomats, the senior scientists, and of course we're not going to sit down until the two presidents come in. So we're standing. We all had our assigned seats. There must have been 50 people in there, I suppose. And we're standing. And we're waiting. Ten minutes go by. People are getting edgy, you know. They started to look, what is there? What's going on here? We're waiting. Nothing. I think 15 minutes past, Chandler bursts in, typical Chandler. He's always in a hurry. Bursts in. He was distraught. He said, I regret to announce that President Johnson and President Marcos have left in a helicopter. He said, No, I didn't know that. But I invite you to sit down and enjoy your lunch, and thank you very much for coming to Erie. Well, Johnson bailed out without even telling Chandler. Okay? This is all true. Years later, I visited Chandler and Sonny, Bob Chandler and Sonny, at their retirement home in Florida. This is maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, just to go see them. And we're talking, reminiscing. I asked Sonny, do you remember that luncheon? He said, boy, do I remember that luncheon. But she said, you know, in the mail, I got a lovely note from Mrs. Johnson. And that note, in effect, said, thank you very much for everything you did for us. We enjoyed our visit. We regret that Lyndon had an emergency and he had to leave suddenly, which is probably nonsense. But uh, again, thank you, and I'm sorry if it caused any problems. It was, a, it was a note of grace on the part of Mrs. Johnson. She showed some class. The old man didn't, but she did. <laughs> I'll never forget that, that day. It was amazing. Well, you wouldn't have had of Erie without the Filipino staff, would you? Impossible. Um, I can only speak for the ones that work directly with, with us in our varietal improvement program. 
And I'd rate them on the basis of working in many countries and working with lots and lots of young people. I'd rate them very highly competent. Well, we have to go back now 40 odd years, don't we? When Erie started, and I'm sure one of the reasons for starting Erie was that in effect, there were no national programs in Asia, in tropical Asia. Uh, certainly there were a few isolated rice people working alone in an uncoordinated way. But there were not, what I would understand today as a national program did not exist. And I think that's one of the unrecognized contributions of Erie. This, this sudden surge of productivity from Erie stimulated governments to start putting money into agriculture, which had not been going in in the 50s, early 60s. And Somehow, national programs developed, and, but that was after my day. So when I was there, I knew individual scientists um, and made trips, but there wasn't what I would consider today to be a national program where you had research and it was all linked together by disciplines, and that was all related to some sort of an extension. extension it just didn't exist as far as I could tell. Sure, there were good people, not many, but good people, scattered around. But it wasn't organized. That came after IRA, after Erie made its, its uh, contribution. Of course, I started in Latin America before going to Erie. And by 1966, I figured, well, the, the problems that I had identified, and I'm sure they weren't all of them, but the ones that got my attention had been resolved, by and large. And we've talked a little bit about that. And I just figured it's time for me to move on. And I think I had two reasons. One was, Erie, to my way of thinking, was something like a university, where a staff member, whatever the discipline, would go down every day to the office or the fields and do his thing. And the thing was within a discipline. It was a clearly defined job. I was a plant breeder. I would be doing plant breeding every day, and I'd be doing it both in the lab and in the field. Well, I had had enough experience in Colombia. I was infected with another philosophy, and that was I was more interested in spending the rest of my life just doing crosses and, and breeding. I wanted to work in the whole gamut of rice production activities. Entomology, weeds, pathology, seed production, developing extension services, all sorts of things like that. And that was just a personal preference. And I knew I, there's no way I could do that at, at Erie. That was one reason. Another one that I, I wanted to leave, uh, these are professional reasons now. The second, I think, was very important in my mind. When I worked in Colombia the first four years before going to Erie, I got to know a lot of farmers, a lot of rice farmers. And I had to, because when I got to Colombia, I was told by the ministry, develop a rice program. There was no rice program. There were no exper experiment stations. There were no people working in rice. So you start at scratch. You're going to build experiment stations. You're going to hire people, professionals, laborers, whatever. You're going to get the equipment. You're going to lay out the fields. And it wasn't easy. And I needed help. And I needed help for certain specific things. And the only way I could get help in those days was to go to farmers. I needed access to their farms, to put things on their farms, because I didn't have experiment stations. So I got to know a lot of farmers. And I enjoyed that very much. At Erie, I wasn't going to meet many farmers. They sure as heavens weren't going to come to Erie. 
And maybe it was language barriers, maybe it was difficulties of flying around Asia, whatever. I felt isolated from farmers. But I knew in Latin America I would have immediate access, and I missed that terribly. So I think for those two reasons, I, by 66, I knew that I, I wanted out. I'd done my job as far as I could. So I went back to Columbia with great joy and pleasure and spent, I don't know, almost 35 years, I suppose. It makes a nice story. I can almost guarantee you that the story is correct for Latin America. I suspect strongly it's exactly the same story in Asia. And in effect, the story is before leaving, before leaving Erie, I sent 100 kilos of seed of IRA to the head of the Rice Federation in Colombia, in Bogota, a very close friend and a wonderful man. He planted that 100 kilos on his farm. And a year or two later, I asked him, how did, how did you make out? He said he couldn't believe it. I suppose 100 kilos, he planted half a hectare. He said, I got eight tons to the hectare. I guess the best he had ever harvested on his farm was maybe four tons. Well, he took that harvest from this half hectare, and so he had four tons of seed. And he broke it up, and he s s distributed it among his buddies in the Rice Federation. People affiliated, farmers, with the Rice Federation, and that's how it got out. And it went like wildfire. Well, I got there in 67, one year later, and I'll never forget. I drove to this one area where the first impact was, and on both sides of the road, and all the schoolyards behind the churches, there were huge mounds of rice, just stockpiled, immense piles of rice, because the drying and, and milling capacity was, was not geared to this sudden surge of production. Of course, that problem resolved itself within a year or two. And then IRA quickly, we got it out of Colombia and to many other countries, mostly tropical, and it had the same impact as it had in Colombia. In Asia, Bob Chandler has estimated the contribution of IR8 on a hectare, on average, was about a half a ton. Well, it doesn't sound like that much, but it was, on a percentage basis, it was enormous. If the average yield in the tropics in Asia then was a ton and a half, another half ton is a third more, that's, that's significant. In Latin America, it was substantially more. It was about two tons on average. Yields jumped from here up to here. All of a sudden, one crop on any, on any farm. And then it took a year or two for it to get spread over all the farms, to the conversion from traditional varieties to semi dwarfs My contention is then it stopped. After the first harvest, yields did not go up any higher. And we all got confused by this. We didn't understand that at all. No matter how many new varieties we produced, and I, something like 400 in Latin America now, semi-dwarfs, yields didn't go up. National averages hit that very high level and plateaued. Okay? Now what's going on? I look at data from Asia, and I think I mentioned in the article, in Asia it's a little bit different. The yields at half a ton was immediate, and then slowly, slowly, but progressively increased like this. Got up to some point, I don't know, three and a half, four tons, something like that. I don't think that was varietal at all. I mean, it's just management, and particularly conversion from rain-fed to irrigated. So what we were seeing was better irrigation. And that slow, it takes time to convert from one ecosystem to another. Well, my, my point is, the variety was like a nova. It explodes, and then it's dead. 
That was the Green Revolution. It had this enormous contribution, and that ended. Everyone talks as if the Green Revolution is a long-term I don't think so. I think it was a one-semester one shot. Why aren't the yields getting higher? We put out lots of varieties. No matter what we did, yields did not improve. It finally dawned on us, I mean, we're pretty slow, I guess. It's got nothing to do with varieties. The variety made its impact. It still had enormous yielding capacity that was not being expressed on the farms. That's called a yield gap. And there are lots of ways to express yield gaps, but take any definition you want. And that gap in Latin America was huge. I think it's three to four tons between what the farmer gets and what he could get with that same variety if he managed it in a different way. Well, that led us to the conclusion it's not. The problem was varietal. It was, unquestionably. And we had a green revolution. It was genetic revolution. Now, we're saying that ended. And we go into an agronomic revolution. Well, there's a long story involved here, except to say that the organization I worked with had a brilliant, has a brilliant agronomist who approached agronomy in a totally different way from the conventional way of thinking of agronomy, and he proved that the limitations with existing semi-dwarf varieties were agronomic, and if put together in a package, the solutions, because they're always on a farm, four or five or six limiting problems, if you package them together, solve them all at once, you get a second revolution. And we did. And that second revolution is as great in magnitude as the first. Now, the second is an ag agronomic. Well, this is not nonsense. This is now proven on millions of hectares in, I'd have to count up, five or six or seven countries. Yields jumped enormously without changing the variety. Standard, I mean, the same old variety, semi-dwarf. Demonstrating, proving that indeed there's a lot of untapped yielding capacity in varieties. Now, what's this all mean? Seems to me it leads us into some pretty dangerous waters here. We're going to talk about where we've gone wrong as a, as a rice community for a long, long time. I have no doubt that the Green Revolution resulted in enormous enthusiasm and stimulated work, continuing work in the area of genetics. Call it breeding, call it genetics, call it biotech on the plant side. We all know this is true. Huge investment. If you looked at the staffing pattern at Erie, it would reflect what little SEAT has. You've got so many people in working with the genetics of the plant in one form or another, and very few in agronomy, relatively. I believe in the last three decades, the problem has been misidentified. We've done all this work on breeding, and breeders have been frustrated around the world. I talked to them. We've tried this, we've tried that. Yields, we cannot get yields higher with these new varieties we're putting out. They're wonderful in quality, they're wonderful in the resistance and adaptability and all of this. Yields aren't going up, with the exception of hybrids, which is the one exception. And so we've misidentified the problem. We've poured all this money into looking for greater yield capacity without understanding that the varieties have been out there for a long time, have unexploited yielding capacity. And the only way to exploit it was to improve the management of the crop on farms. This is a story that's true and pretty well accepted in Latin America, and it's extending. Extension of agronomic-based technology is very slow in compared to the extension of seed-based technology. Seed-based technology is fast. 
put some seed in a box, you send it to a guy in another country, he gets it out, and all of a sudden every farmer's got it. Extension agronomy is slow, because it's farmer to farmer, extension agent to farmer, to the next farmer, to the next agent. But it's as powerful as the Green Revolution. And this leads us to ask, what's gonna, what is the future? Where, where do we go now? If we've had two alternating revolutions, in my mind, I believe, the next revolution will revert to become varietal again for the second time. The first was IRA type, Green Revolution, agronomic. That agronomic is gonna close this yield gap now what do we do? Now we're going to need greater yielding capacity. And how do we do this? Uh, the last four or five years of my life, I've been focused on that, on that problem. How to get higher yield capacity without going the hybrid route. Okay? Mm, it's possible that we now have a much better understanding. I think it's possible to make one more jump and that will, again, be genetic. So you have this fascinating sequence of contributions, of revolutions. First one discipline, then the next. And progress depends upon how well you've done the previous. They won't, they don't talk to each other, hardly. Uh, ideally, yes. However, I'd only add, and this will infuriate some people, I think, the Green Revolution, in my mind, in Latin America, for sure, had very little input from agronomy. Very little. Except he changed the variety, and he tended to use more nitrogen. That was the one contribution from agronomy. The agronomic revolution is 100% agronomic. There's no component of variety in there because they're using the same old varieties that have been out there for a few years. The next revolution, if it indeed turns out to be genetic, ideally, it will involve the collaboration of the two disciplines because to detect this putative higher capacity, you have to do it on farm. You cannot do this on experiment stations. And if you're going to do it on farms, it has to be under ideal management. And that's where agronomy and breeding have got to come together. I'm not too hopeful that that will be too easy to accomplish, but it's a, it's a precondition. We're comparing apples and oranges here. In Asia, my understanding is that the national programs are still quite good, strong. In Latin America, they died, almost without exception. The public sector national programs, ministries of agriculture or their subsidiaries, have gone. They're no longer operative, OK? And there are many explanations why this happened in Latin America. And I'm sure there are explanations why they're still strong and active in Asia. But what does that mean? Take SEAT. The system for many years from the beginning of SEAT was you do work at SEAT, you link to the national program, which takes whatever you're selling, whatever technology you have, they evaluate it, maybe improve it somewhat, take it to the farmer. SEAT never worked with farmers, except when I could sneak out and I didn't tell anybody. If there are no national programs, SEAT has no client. Who's it working for? So in the case of Latin America, the system is not operative today. It's not functioning. The CG centers are divorced from their clients, the clients being the farmers, because there's no intermediary to take this technology and extend it. Asia, I presume it's, it's still the old system where Erie can go to the national program and hence out to the farms. So where does Erie stand? Well, in, in light of my experience, I don't know because I haven't been there in so long. All I can tell you is what's happened in Latin America. 
And that's given impetus in our case of uh, privately financed research, user financed research as opposed to public. Little organizations are popping up financed by the users, the farmers, through various checkoff systems. That's appealing to me for at least one reason. And it is simply that the person who's putting the money in determines what the work will be. Okay? He goes to the scientist and said, I'm going to give you money in this institution, financed by farmers, growers associations, and you will do this and this and this with my money. Okay. Fair enough. Go to SEAT today. Ask him, what are you doing? I'm doing this and that. Why are you doing that? Well, I got a million dollars from the German bank or something, or Swiss, or God knows where. Maybe it's got nothing to do with what the farmers are asking for. See, the, the decision of what you do with your life, if it's not related to the farmer, I don't understand it. And SEAT is not working for the farmer because they're working on grant or what do you call these monies uh, that come from projects on things of interest to the donors. Farmers, no, they're not involved. That's why I like these, this new surging <laughs> model. I don't know if it's going to work or not. But this is not applicable, as I understand it, to the Erie, Asia. I don't know. It's a different game. Now, I know what I've said is going to upset people at SEAT. They're going to be offended by what I said. I am not saying this to offend anybody, and particularly my very valued colleague, Bob Ziegler. I'm not saying this, but I do believe in what I'm saying. And it's simply one man's opinion. Well, let's preface the remarks by admitting that I have not been back to Erie for probably 25 years. I'm out of touch, clearly, with the Asian situation. What I can speak about with some confidence is what I learned and I've seen in Latin America. It's an entirely different environment. But let's go back to this agronomy thing for a minute. A good question is, why wasn't this done before in agronomy? None of the solutions to the identified problems, there were six problems in common over most farms in Latin America, none of those solutions are new to science. They've been well worked out. It's just putting them together. Why wasn't this done before? Why did we wait 30 odd years concerned about this barrier to productivity on farms? Uh, obviously, there have been many good agronomists, obviously. And I know, have known many. And that's equally true, I'm, I'm convinced, in Asia as it is in, in my area, in the Americas. I think the answer might be that agronomists tend to become specialists. There are experts on weed control. There are experts on fertilization, on planting methods, densities, on machinery, on leveling of land and water control. They're, they're all good, but they're specialists. And if a farmer comes in and says, my yields are not very good, can you help me? A specialist will go to the farm, let's say. Say he's a, a wizard on weed control. And that farmer's going to have weed problems, I know it. And he shows the farmer how to control his weeds. And he does. His yields are not going to go up. Because the other four or five problems are negating the impact of that one. You've solved one, but you've left four or five, and the yields aren't just going to respond. So you have to solve them simultaneously. Okay? If there are four or five problems, you've got to solve four or five problems simultaneously. And there's a lot of evidence this is true. If you solve all of them, the yield goes up superbly. If you solve four of the five, it goes up very well. Three, less, two, and so on. But agronomists don't tend to 
to work on this broad conceptualization of looking at the entire farm. They're looking at their area at which they're very good, but they're missing the rest. I suspect that's the answer. Why it hasn't been done in an integrated fashion previously. Now the question, or one question is, what I'm talking about, is this applicable to Asia? Is the relative lack of progress in productivity in Asia in part or in large part due to inappropriate management? Or are the people who have been investing in varieties and genetics and biotech, are they right? It's been a varietal problem. I think it's agronomy. I see no reason to suggest that what is true in one continent is not going to be true in the next. I suspect that that is true. And now we're trying to address the question, what might Erie do in the future? Uh, understanding that this is a Latin American talking, not someone from Asia. And so there's a bit of speculation in here. But I think Erie has gone off in the wrong tangent in two cases, in two examples. One is, you read between the lines, there's a, still a very heavy investment in the genetic side of, of farm improvement varieties. If you lump together everybody that's in biotech with breeding and genetics and so on, put it all into one package, and there's very little comparable attention to agronomy. I think that is out of balance. If indeed the constraint on farms today in Asia, as in America, is largely because the management is not appropriate, it just clearly says to you, you've got to focus on the agronomy. The next big jump is going to be agronomy. If everything I'm saying is true, that leads us to another problem. How do you do agronomy? Where do you, where do, you do agronomy? I've never known, in 50 years maybe, of a real impact coming from some sort of agronomic research that was experimented and evaluated and proven out of an experiment station. I just don't believe it. I think it's got to be done on farms, under real conditions, where the farmer's doing the planting, incorporating whatever suggestions the specialist is telling him to do. But it makes extension so much easier. It convinces farmers, if it's on his farm, experiment stations to me are artifacts, represent nothing other than that one experiment station. Now, agronomists are not frequently keen to do essentially all of their work on farms. They generally like the protection of experiment stations. And if you do that, I think you're doomed. So this transition is not going to be easy. So that's one. The one area that I think Erie ought to take leadership. And I know in your national programs, which tend to be very strong in Asia compared to Latin America, where they're essentially defunct, that they're good agronomists. But again, they're going to be specialists, very good in one thing or good in the other. And to organize all of that resource base of peoples into a, a new approach of doing it on farms and doing it together, all packaged together, demonstration plots, if you care. Uh, we just don't believe much in replicated plots, little tiny plots. And everything is on farms and everything is big. A plot to us on a farm is five hectares or 10 hectares. No reps, but it's replicated over farms. So you have many farms, okay. So that's one area. I think there's a terrible imbalance between crop management and genetics. Way out of whack. It has been for 30 years. We got seduced by the, how easy it was to produce 
IR8 or semi-dwarf wheats. And we just sort of concluded that if we just do a little more, we'll do better. It didn't work. We did a lot more, and it didn't get better. Okay? The second area, and the, my eerie colleagues are not going to like this at all. I don't remember, but I think from my time, which is 40 years ago, compared to today in Asia, tropical Asia, that there's been a substantial shift from a predominant rain-fed culture, which has decreased in importance, while the irrigated sector has increased in importance, in acreage, in, in area. I suspect that's true, but I'm, I'd sure like to see some numbers, I don't know. The new Erie document has a very clear emphasis on rain-fed rice. I'm contending that it's been progressively declining, but that has to be confirmed. I'm not positive about that. I am not a believer in rain-fed, nor was I much of a believer in upland, in our situation in the Americas. If you're going to put your resources on improving, improving upland, you're making the assumption that there isn't much progress to be realized with irrigated. And I think that statement comes out. Bald statement. We have gotten most of what's possible with our irrigated technology, and we don't see where we can go much further. Well, I've already said that you've been looking in the wrong direction. But if you're going to try and approach that complex of, of uh, rain-fed, you're dealing with some intractable problems. Drought tolerance, for one. I'm not convinced there is much. You're dealing with irregular erratic water. It rains, it doesn't rain, submergence, droughty. You're dealing with, inevitably, a series of uh, mineral nutrition interactions between the soil and the lack of water. You're going to have all kinds of deficiencies coming up. These are hard. And why do you do that? The great, the great God-given benefit of rice is that it does well with its feet and water. If you take the water away, you just got another cereal. Call it sorghum. Call it maize. Whatever. Why try and convert what, take away the great gift of rice, which it does so splendidly if it has water sitting on it, and turn it into something that it's just, in evolutionary terms, it just never went through that, that process. In short, I don't think you can do much. If you put all your resources on this declining rain fed, and it's going to be very, very difficult, I don't think you're going to have much to show for it. I do think, and I'll take the opposite position just for the sake of argument, you have not extracted from the irrigated sector all the good that's in there. You've gotten a portion of it. And IR8 and the subsequent varieties obviously helped enormously in that respect. But you've got a yield gap in irrigated, and I just wouldn't believe it if someone tried to argue to me that there isn't much yield gap. I think it's there, and I think it's big. So that means to me, I would invest in irrigated preference to irrigated. And I'd try and figure out, what is this yield gap due to? Now, I've been arguing it probably as agronomy, but who knows? I think the future is in irrigated, although water is declining. I don't think you can keep people on the farm with low yield, rain-fed, upland, marginalized ecologies that have little productivity in them. Today, I don't think you, it's, a, it's, I don't think it's sustainable. Irrigated rice is, is sustainable if it's well done. And it can be much more efficient in terms of water. So if I were Erie, I'd take the leadership in those two areas. I'd go back on a focus on irrigating, particularly in the dry season when water is short. Figure out ways to capture water. 
yields are always much higher in the dry season than the rainy season. And I would certainly emphasize agronomy, management, management of the crops. I occasionally watch the news on American television and I see short clips of farmers in, in um, China, women particularly, out there with a bag of fertilizer wading through a rice paddy. There's water on the field. They're taking urea and throwing it into the water. That's dinosaur age. You don't do that. You lose your urea when you throw it into water. Examples like that. The nitrogen efficiency must be terrible. And as you convert, which I think is probably inevitable, it'll take you a while, convert in Asia from transplanted to direct seeded, I think that has to come. In any ecology, irrigated or even rain fed, you're gonna run into new problems. New problems. They're just built into these two planting systems. You and I talked a little bit yesterday about the absolute requirement for tolerance to the late harvest if you direct seed, which you do not need if you transplant. That's one example. So I would suggest that, yes, you need an Erie. Erie is uniquely positioned to show leadership. If Erie settles back and becomes just another good research institution among many in Asia. I don't see much need for Erie. It's just another one. It's leadership. You have to lead the way, as we did many years ago, and as I think you can in the future. And then you ask yourself, now where, where am I going to lead this crop, this commodity? Exactly. What can we do to make it more productive? Those would be my two ideas. It was so long ago, and you know that you're always going to make mistakes. It's inevitable, particularly in plant breeding. If, if you're good, as I was mentioning to you yesterday, my guess is that every thousand crosses you make, you might develop a variety. That means you failed 999 times out of 1,000. <laughs> sure, you make mistakes all the time, but the big issues, gee, I don't know. It just seemed to have worked. Whatever we did, it, it worked. And, and I judge it on, on that basis, knowing that it screwed up inevitably in many ways. But on balance, I think it was OK. And I wouldn't have changed much. There was a very famous baseball, American baseball, uh, general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. I was a fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers when I was a little boy. That was Branch Rickey. He was a wizard, and he said, luck is the residue of design. I think he was right. Sure, you're lucky. Some people are lucky, some people are not lucky. Why are some people lucky? Uh, I think it's because they've been thinking about this a lot. You know, it's, luck does appear on its own volition, I know, from time to time, but a lot of luck is, to, is the consequence of putting a lot of mental observational evidence all together, and this, all of a sudden it, it happens, it works. Yeah, there's luck, there's always luck. But you, sometimes you earn your luck. You influence your luck, sure. I wish I were 26 years old again.